What's up, everybody? Welcome to Trust and Believe. I'm really excited today because, as you all know, for the last eight or nine weeks since we've been in quarantine, we've been doing wine night. And wine night has been sponsored by Dry Farm Wines. Um, a lot of you have gone to dryfarmwines.com slash T to join us for these amazing evenings. And today, I have Todd White, the the creator, the CEO, the the man that makes us feel good on a Friday. Todd, how you feeling, man? Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday too, right? <laughs> so yeah. every we we drink wine on every day that ends in a Y. You know, I'll tell you this: there since quarantine happened, Scott and I actually had a conversation, and we're like, you know, we've been drinking more like three nights a week, but like at the other nights, like that month, that usually Monday or even last night, which is Wednesday night. You know, we have a glass just to kind of like, you know, I call it a nightcap. But um, tell me, tell me more about yourself. Tell us about Dry Farm Wines, how it started. I think people will be so, you know, excited to hear. Well, I've been a biohacker since the 1980s before biohacking was even a thing, right? And the most common biohack is a diet. And I had started experimenting with the Atkins diet which is a modified ketogenic diet back in the 1980s to maintain weight control and just feel better. And, but I would use it periodically. Then about six years ago, I decided to start experimenting with therapeutic ketogenic diet, like a very strict keto diet. And, um, and so it worked really well for me. And I was trying to break through a slight weight loss plateau I had at the time. I just reached, and many people experiment with a keto diet to break through weight loss plateaus. But it worked so well for me and the cognitive benefits and the energy and the, the, just the benefits for me, along with intermittent and extended fasting, just really worked really well for me. But at the same time, I've been a lifelong wine drinker and been drinking since I was nine years old. Hey. Right? And, uh, and so, in fact, I love wine so much that 22 years ago, I moved from, from Atlanta to the Napa Valley which is the most important wine appellation in North America, where I continue to live today. Although today I don't drink domestic wines for reasons that we'll discuss. But so when I went keto and started really getting serious about fasting, I found I couldn't drink conventional wines anymore. And they were making me sick and brain fog and terrible hangovers. And I drink wine every day, right? Unless I'm on an extended water fast, I drink, I drink wine every single day and have for many, many years. And, but it may have been a combination of getting older. It may have been a combination of keto. It, it could be a combination of the toxicity levels that have been rising in, in conventional wines. Right. Could have been a number of things. But I initially thought it was alcohol. I thought, you know, I'm, because alcohol levels have been rising in conventional wines for the last 30 years. And now they're nearly 15% on average. And so I thought you know, if I just drink lower alcohol wines, then I'll feel better. And in fact, I started experimenting with lower alcohol wines. They're very difficult to find in the United States, but they are made in Europe. And I started experimenting with those. And then I stumbled upon the natural wine revolution, which was just really getting underway in central France at the time. And when I use the term natural wine, it's very confusing to most people. They're like, well, aren't all wines natural? And for the reasons I'm about to explain to you, they are not. Less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of wines in the world are considered natural. And natural is an international category. And we're the largest natural wine importer and reseller in the world. And you know from drinking these wines, since you have experience with it, you feel better. Uh, and I want, you know, I don't want to cut you off, but I do have to say, so I wanted to tell like a little bit of my story that I think will go into your your story about um, you know, the wine itself and how it's made and, and, and the benefits. So a, a couple, a few years ago, I actually didn't drink for a year and a half because, because I was drinking and I just felt like crap. And I, it, it, I just was, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily like 
just the terrible hangovers, but I was barely drinking, Todd. I was, Scott called me a lightweight and I couldn't even get mad. I would have one, one drink and I would feel terrible. By like within an hour and a half, I would feel like, I'm like, why am I even doing this? So I stopped drinking for a year and a half and I felt amazing. And I slowly started bringing drinks back into my life. But I have to be honest, I stopped drinking wine because I always my skin felt tight. My skin felt leathery. My stomach felt bloated. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier about having brain fog. And so I, the same thing, I said, oh, maybe it's that I'm getting older. Maybe it's the amount of alcohol. And I really stopped drinking wine all the way to the point where when we were going to have wine night and, and our friends told us about dry farm wine, I was very hesitant. I was, I was just like, there's no way. And especially and so, red wines. Especially red wines to the max. Super right. toxic. White wine, it was interesting. White wine, that you say that, I, did, I mean, I thought about it, but to, to talk about it, I actually started, and I liked red wine better. For sure. Yes, but I started drinking white wine because it just felt less of that side effect. It's right? less toxic so we in were, conventional wines. Now, our wines are all clean. So Shalene Johnson and Brett Johnson said to us, you know, Sean and Scott, like, try this. Like, you're going to feel great. And you're not, and I was very hesitant. And I remember sitting at... I, you know, my table at night where I watch TV or whatever. And I said, I'm gonna pour this. And I, number one, when I was drinking and I was like, okay, this feels good. And I was like, we'll see the next day. I had two glasses and I felt, I woke up like normal. And you know, I don't like doing, you know, the false promises. Like everybody's gonna feel this way. But I was like, I know how I used to feel when I drink wine and I stopped drinking it. And so I would love for you to explain what you know the like where that comes from scientifically well here's the deal so wines natural wines and we'll talk about what a natural wine means because it's a very simple internationally understood category for people who know anything about wine natural wine making what i'm going to describe to you is the way wines were made 100 years ago mm -hmm. right what's happened in the last 50 years in particular what really started in the 1920s so in the 1920s, we really departed from, uh, from polyagricultural practices to monoagricultural practices using chemicals to farm. That's where it all started. As, as biodiversity and polyagricultural practices went away and everything got focused on chemical farming, that was the beginning of the end of natural wines. Then it got escalated in the 80s and 90s and the 2000s through corporate greed and massive consolidation within the wine industry. And here's why that's important. And it's important to understand this. If you really wanna know about what happened to wine and why it's toxic today and why you feel bad drinking it, and particularly red wines. This begins with greed and money. Uh, it's the same reason that, that uh, irrigation is widely practiced in the United States. We don't allow any irrigation on any of our grapevines. That's the reason our company is called Dry Farm Wines. That means farmed without irrigation. 99% of US vineyards are now irrigated. Why? Because you get bigger yields, it's cheaper to farm, it's easier to farm, and the fruit weighs more when it's filled with water. Fruit sold by the ton, right? All of this is about money. And it's also about a collusion between the wine industry and politicians in Washington. And I'm gonna tell you what's happening there. So but this begins with it's exactly the same thing that happened in our food supply, right? So about 10 different companies touch basically everything that you eat in one way or another, unless you're buying it low. So the same thing happened in the wine supply during the 80s and 90s in this massive corporate consolidation. So everything I'm about to tell you is easily verifiable with Google search. So this is not marketing spin. It's not something Todd made up or believes. This is healthy lifestyle, right? Hey. <laughs> so, the, you know, we, 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 we walk the walk. When you go in the grocery store and you see, you know, how, thousands of bottles of wine down a long shelf, or you go into a wine shop, mm -hmm. most of those wines are made by just a handful of companies. Now, statistically, the top three wine companies in the world, in the U.S., make 52% of all U.S. wines. The top 30 wine companies in the United States make over 70% of US wines. So when you go in the grocery store, most of what you're looking at there is made by a handful of companies. 
Now, they don't want you to know that, right? So they hide behind these multi-billion dollar marketing conglomerates, hide behind thousands of brands and labels. See, what they want you to believe is that you're drinking from a farmhouse or a chateau, a little family thing, right? In fact, you're drinking wines that are made in massive wine factories in Central California. These are like multiple football fields large, right? So most of the wine that's sold in the United States are made in these wine factories. Now, you can't make factory wine without the use of additives and chemicals. And you can't farm factory wine without the use of chemicals and farming. Those are just facts. Here's the problem. There's 76 additives approved by the FDA for the use in winemaking. Let me repeat that. There are 76 additives approved for the use in winemaking in the United States by the FDA. Now, why don't you know that? I'll tell you why you don't know it. Because the politicians greased up with lobby money in Washington have prevented contents labels on wine bottles. Right? The wine industry doesn't want you to know what's in that wine, and I'm going to tell you why. The politicians have colluded with the wine industry to keep you in the dark about what's in your wine. And that what's in your wine is what's making you feel bad. And most people think that's just what drinking wine makes them feel like, right? And they just like wine enough that they're willing to go along with it. And so the most dangerous of these chemicals is called dimethyl dicarbonate. It's a highly toxic chemical. It's marketed under the brand name Valcarin, and it's used to treat tens of millions of gallons of wine in the United States. And it's used to treat the single most common bacterial fault found in wine called Brettamyces. It's a very, very toxic chemical. If you look it up on Wikipedia, it'll say hazard colon toxic. If you want to drink dimethyl dicarbonate, I, I'm okay with that. I just think you should know that you're drinking it, right? I just think there should be a contents label. And if wine had a contents label on it, it would look just like the rest of processed foods. Mm -hmm. It'd have a little rectangular label on it with a whole bunch of stuff you never heard of, don't know what it is. Now, in fairness, some of the 76 additives are actually natural. But you wouldn't be able to tell if you look at the list what's natural and what's not natural because they're all names that you wouldn't understand. The problem with natural wine is you can't make it in very large quantities. Wine is filled with bacterial risk in the winemaking process in the cellar. Right? So if you're going to make wine in any appreciable quantity, you're going to have to use chemicals and additives to control the process, right? So that you don't have a risk of a failed fermentation. Natural wine simply means nothing in, nothing out. All right. So natural wine meets the following criteria. Now, it, let me mention that there's no certification for natural wine yet. Mm. France just announced that they are creating a national certification for natural wines. Dry Farm Wines, my company, we have a certification process and I'll explain to you what that is because it's, it's several notches, it's several bars above just being natural wine. Natural wine means that it's always organic or biodynamically farmed. That means no chemicals in farming. Biodynamic farming is a, an advanced prescriptive form of organic farming. Number two, this is very important, they are always fermented with wild indigenous yeast found on the skin of the grape that's indigenous to the vineyard where the grape is grown. On the skin of every grape berry in the world at the time of harvest, it has a waxy kind of whitish coating on the berry. That's yeast. That yeast was collected through the air. It's a wild yeast that's native to the vineyard where the grape was grown. Yeast gets pressed in with the juice. It activates. It'll start fermenting in what's called a spontaneous fermentation. What's happening in commercial wines and in these wine factories is that they're not using native yeast. In fact, there's native yeast on the fruit. But the first thing they do when they press the juice is they pour sulfur dioxide into the juice. This is the first chemical interaction that happens. I mean, other than chemicals in farming, right? Like glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, right? So the first thing they do is introduce sulfur dioxide because they want to kill the native yeast, because mm. they can't have their genetically modified commercial lab-grown yeast that they're going to inoculate it with competing with the native yeast. Commercial winemakers always use commercial yeast. It's genetically modified, it's grown in a lab, and it's modified to be very sturdy. See, the reason they don't want to work with the wild native yeast is that they're very temperamental. 
right? They're, they're, they require a lot of coddling and attention and you, you have to pay very close attention to them and you, uh, or you'll have a broken fermentation. And when you have broken fermentation, you have a real problem. Then you have to try to get your, re, your ferment restarted again. It's very difficult and risky. Kill the native yeast, commercial winemaker then inoculates the juice with a genetically modified commercial lab grown yeast. Again, to make wine without these additives, you can't make natural wines in very high volumes. We work with over 800 natural wine family farms around the world. None in the United States. There are no wines made in the United States that meet our criteria. Yeah, let's talk about the alcohol. I, I I love it. it surprises many people to hear the wine guy say, alcohol is a very dangerous neurotoxin, right? Because, because I think people should drink less. I don't drink less often, I drink less alcohol. And there's mm. a big distinction there. If I want to drink less alcohol, I'm going to have to begin with a lower amount in the bottle, right? Unless I want to drink fewer glasses. Uh, personally, I don't drink a glass or two of wine. I drink several glasses. I don't drink during the daytime. I also don't eat in the daytime either. I only eat once a day, right? So I eat at night between six and seven. That's when I drink wine. And I usually drink, I know this might be frightful to you, but I usually drink a bottle a night. Now the wines I'm drinking are just, I select extra low alcohol for myself. So the wines I'm drinking are usually between nine and 11% alcohol. One, I wanna drink less alcohol. Number two, I like the taste of lower alcohol wines better. They're more friendly with food because they contain more water. I mean, there's only three things in wine, water, alcohol, and then polyphenols, flavonoids, and the other health compounds that are primarily found in red wines, which is why red wines are healthier. And the, the, the primary, the best known polyphenol is called resveratrol. It's been shown to extend lifespan in, in, in organisms. And is, a, oh, cool. you know, is a very popular supplement for people who are interested in longevity. It's also contained in red wine. So alcohol, we have to, we, if we want to enjoy the cognitive benefits and the cardiovascular benefits of moderate alcohol consumption and that consumption primarily of red, red and white wines, we should approach that from a health and wellness point of view through moderation. And since I don't want to drink a glass, what I'm going to have to do is lower the alcohol in the bottle, right? And so I'm the largest proponent for low alcohol wines in the world. I've been talking about it and promoting it as a healthier way to live long before anybody else thought about it, long before White Claw and Hard Seltzers came along, you know, that we should be drinking less alcohol. Mm. And alcohol ruins millions of people's lives every year, right? And so this is just fact. I have had in my, you know, when I was young, I mean, I had a tenuous relationship with alcohol, right? So that, this, this is just, this is just real. And so I now sell a product that I can drink a bottle of or, there about every night and as often as I want. I don't drink during the daytime, as I mentioned, and nobody at my company drinks during the daytime, which is very unusual for people in the wine business, right? But we're first and foremost health enthusiasts. We're health evangelists, right? When you meet my staff or you see any of them on Instagram or they're, they're all ripped out, right? Because we're really, we're health and fitness gurus. That's, that's our, we just happen to love wine. I think you can testify here that not only do you not have hangovers, not only do you feel better afterwards, but actually these wines lift your spirit. Yeah, I think that, you know, one of the things, because there are, there was a couple of things that I wanted to ask, but I didn't want to interrupt. Um, and this might go back a little bit, but you know, you said you eat once a day. I'm an intermittent faster. I'm a 16, I'm a eight, 16 and eight. Uh, and you said that you eat, pretty much every day between six and seven, and you have a bottle of wine. There are people out there who are gonna hear that and they're like, you have a bottle of wine every night and you only eat once a day. And I would like you to talk about the, the benefits you get from eating like that, especially when you're combining it with the low alcohol bottle of wine. Cause some people are going to say, well, what kind of calories are you eating? And you know, how is that? How did, you know, I'm sure you've gotten, how is that considered healthy? And so I wanted, I would love for you to talk well, about that. I mean, we could do a whole show on fasting, right? Right, right, And right. autophagy and the benefits of fasting. Right. But for me, it was both, you know, it's both sanity and vanity, 
right? So I'm 60, right? And, you know, I wanted to, you know, continue to enjoy a vibrant life as I go into the next 50 years, right? And for me, fasting, I used to be on the 16-8 or lean, gain, lean gains method, as it's also known as. I did that for two years, and I've been on, uh, I've been on a once-a-day meal. And look, I'm in the taste business. I love food. I love anything associated with taste. I have been a taste enthusiast since I was a child. So for me, it, it, it's both, you know, wellness is about sanity and vanity. And I'm free to admit that. I'm, I, I intend to have a vibrant, very active life for another 50 years, right? And so for me, it became apparent that fasting, and I'll talk about calories in a moment, it became apparent to me and the research and when I saw other people, how they look when they were on a ketogenic diet, a ketogenic diet is just a fasting mimicking diet in essence, right? right? You're just lowering down your glucose response in a ketogenic diet because it's so high in fat. But you can do the same thing through fasting, mm -hmm. right? Because you just, and fasting is just more effective because you're having no glucose response, you know, Correct. In, in, until the evening. So you're spending the whole day, you're spending 22 hours or 20 to 22 hours with zero, zero uh, glucose response, no, no insulin, which is also what the ketogenic diet does. It allows you to eat, but with a lower glucose response. I happen to believe that glucose response and the hyperproduction of insulin is the key to a long, healthy life. I mean, the, the lowering, lowering our insulin production. And I believe that sugar and hyperinsulin production is responsible for most of the chronic illness that the planet faces today. And so, and I'm not alone in that thought. And I also, when I look at people who fast and when I look at them, when they're on the ketogenic diet, they have less inflammation in their face. The biggest transformation that I've had since I've been fasting for about a year, which is Hands the blow down. in my face, I would, I would, I would work out, you know, I'm a workout enthusiast, obviously. And I would go to the mirror in the morning or in the evening, pretty much, or in the afternoon, at any point in the day when I wasn't fasting, because I was just like, I'm going to eat six meals a day and whatever. And I would see this like really odd distortion in my face. It was so crazy. And so I have a naturally kind of like, you know, I got some cheeks, you know what I'm saying? Sure. But when I started fasting, and I don't know if you can really tell because of the angle of the camera, like I actually, for the first time was like, oh, I have like really high cheekbones up here. Never saw them in my entire life when I looked in the mirror. I fasted for a year and I, you know, and again, like I said, I stopped drinking red wine altogether and I lowered my alcohol. I didn't drink alcohol at all for a year and a half. And it, anyway, it was just absolutely incredible that when I started fasting, I was like, there's no bloat at all. And when I watch videos of myself like dancing, cause I love TikTok and things like that. Like, whereas I always used to feel like I was like a thick person. Like I have zero inflammation in my body. And then the last thing I'll say, which I think you'll appreciate is that Scott and I would go out to dinner and every single time I would say, I would have a stomach ache. Like, I would just, I would get back in a car. I could eat healthy and I would still have a stomach ache. And ever since I started fasting, like all of that inflammation in my body has gone down. I even got stem cell therapy about seven, eight months, seven or eight months ago. And that, that happened about six months after I did fasting or whatever. I forget the time frame. And even my knees, the inflammation in my knees with the stem cells combined with the fasting has completely changed my life. And I'm gonna say something pretty funny right now, which I think you'll get. You're like, so I was a professional dancer and I used to be able to drop it low, pick it up, boom. I used to get to the floor and come up out and I wasn't able to do that for years because my knees were just like, my body was just inflamed, even when I was ripped. And so, well, I'm still ripped. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I say all that to say, intermittent fasting like completely changed that. and. You know, that's why I was nervous to drink the wines in the beginning. And even after drinking your wines for two months consistently, um, still no bloat, no stomach ache. I don't wake up in the middle of the night like, oh my gosh, like, you know, if you drink, you can't sleep that well. So anyway, I say all that to say, as a testimonial to not just the wine itself, but just, just choosing a healthier lifestyle 
and and the fasting and the insulin production and and all of that amazing thing which is why i've been i've stuck to intermittent fasting for a year yeah i've been on i think once a day like for three years now but to a couple of years before that i was on lean gains but when other than meditation i think fasting is the single most effective biohack that i do and i also tell you this you may want to experiment with it when i went from a twice 16 8 protocol into the 20 to 22 hours it had a profound impact on my life and and now i'm doing now i've even had to adapt in order to stay as lean as i want to stay which is a big part of the inflammation and, and vibrant activity i want to continue to have I'm having to do regular extended water fast. I'm typically three days, sometimes five. I don't enjoy the five day. The three day is pretty easy for me. But fasting is emotional, right? I mean, I, I never eat because I'm hungry. I eat for entertainment because mm. I enjoy it, right? And because I want to drink wine and I don't want to drink wine without eating, right? And so that I never eat because I'm hungry. I mean, I'm never hungry. I'm in ketosis every day because I only eat once a day. And then even when I do eat, I'm eating what I would call a modified ketogenic diet. So it's not therapeutic. I mean, there's like three different levels of keto diet in my opinion, right? There's therapeutic, which is like 70 to 85% fat, right? And then there's, um, then there's a modified ketogenic diet, which is what I do. And then there's what I call low carb, right? Which is not keto, but just lower carb. Right? right. All three are great. Therapeutic is tedious and difficult to stick to for a long period of time. And, um, and, and you bore with it over time because it's basically a very dense diet. Mm -hmm. And then the, the modified ketogenic diet, which is what I eat, which is, which is lower in fat, you know, uh, 40, 50% fat, and then moderate protein and no refined carbohydrates, right? Only, only, um, whole raw carbohydrate, except for the fact that I cheat in one area. I happen to have a softness for French fries. Me too. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I do eat French fries a few times a week just because I happen to just love them. I love I, fried I, potatoes and salt. I mean, what's wrong with that? I have to send you years ago. I was on vacation and I was like, I'm not going to work. I'm not going to work. But I was at the pool. And I always, when I go on vacation, I, I eat French fries. So I did a podcast. I think it's like a seven minute podcast on the love of fries. And I need to send you this link so you, because right. I think you'll understand. Like I love, I love French fries so much. But anyway. Right. I don't eat them in very large quantities. I don't eat right. them by themselves. It's always with protein and and exactly. So and I don't eat them in high quantities, but I just love the taste and texture of them. No matter what I eat within reason, by two or three o'clock in the afternoon, I'm back in ketosis because I haven't eaten for, you know, since the night before. Right. Yeah, I don't drink coffee anymore. I drink chamomile tea and water. That's, that's it during the daytime. When I'm on an extended water fast, that's the only time I don't drink wine. Fasting, I, I just can't recommend it enough. And I will, people ask me about eating a meal a day program all the time. And what I tell them is, you know, I went from 16, eight to, to once a day, and it took me about six weeks to acclimate to that. Not because I was hungry, but there's this emotional element and there's a social element right in the middle of the day of going to lunch with people, mm. right? And so I, I missed the entertainment of food. It took me a while to adjust emotionally to only eating once per day. What I tell you today is there, I would never return to it, right? I will never return to eating more than one, one meal a day, ever. It's such mm. a profound impact on my life. It's not easy to get acclimated to. Yeah, yeah because I, I do a 24, a 20 to 24 hour just fast once a week. I stay, I have a challenge where I stay in bed for 12 hours and I fast for either 20 or 24. And just that day alone, just resting the body, fasting, I mean, it just, it's amazing, but I know I would have a tough time, probably like you said, emotionally, getting to eating that once a day. Um, it also helps if your partner, you know, or people, and look, it, it's very challenging for, even 16, eight's very challenging for the average person because they're in a household full of people or a partner who has stuff in the house. Look, if it's in the house, it's more tempting to eat it. 
right, crackers right. or, you know, and for people in their normal work schedule, now they're sheltered at home. But when they go to the office, the average office is filled with, you know, cakes and donuts stuff. And, <laughs> stuff. and it's just in the kitchen where you go to get your coffee or tea or water. And yeah. just walking past it is just, it's just very emotionally tempting. It's but when magnetic. You're able, <laughs> yeah, when you're able to remove it from your life, and in my case, my partner also fat, also only eats once per day with me. And, and that's just our lifestyle. Right, you know? right. And so he previously to being together with me, he ate probably a couple of times a day, but had experimented with fasting before, right? And yeah. so, so now, you know, it, it makes it a lot easier if, if your household or your partner is also participating with you. Yeah. And, and for me, Scott will sometimes, but he's not, but you know, and, but we, are, we also have twin boys. So I'm around, I mean, they, we have healthy food for them, but you know, they also love the sure, tater tots, like these Who things. Love tater tots? And we try to get, me? I know, I love your French fries, but, and we get them like the broccoli, the cauliflower, this, you know, but, um, I, I, I found it, Scott and I have always eaten differently. And I've, I've, you know, I've tried the vegetarian thing. I've done a lot and sometimes he'll join in, but I'm so used to being like the, what do I say? Like I always spearhead the change or like the enhancement and the way we eat. So I'm kind of used to it. And I'm just like, I'm, I'm pretty good at having the stuff in the cabinet and not eating it. But um, you're right for people out there. It's, it's much easier. And I've, I get a lot of questions of people saying, you know, what if my spouse doesn't eat healthy you know they have to make two yeah, different meals because their spouse it's is hard. like it's reluctant um a, a fasting tangent but i think that you know i think it really solidifies and helps people understand like your love of health and and the fact that dry farm wines is a health food company and so what are some of the things for people out there who may be like oh well it's low sugar or it's you know it's not enough it's not a lot of alcohol like i'm not going to enjoy it as much what are some of the things you can say to them that's well actually kind of it's just the opposite i mean i think as you've experienced it's just the right. opposite actually it tastes better and it's friendlier with food because alcohol is not friendly with food you don't have a salad and a vodka right? mm -hmm. and so it's friendly with food it tastes better and also you know we talked about this a moment so natural wines, because they haven't been sterilized with the preservative sulfur dioxide, right? They haven't been sterilized, they're still alive, right? So they still have living bacteria in them. Dr. David Perlmutter, the best-selling, New York Times best-selling author on the gut microbiome, you know, and it's and the importance of gut health, has has written several times about us, about our wines, because our wines still contain living bacteria that are beneficial to the gut microbiome. Mm. But these wines are alive and they taste alive. They have spirit. And because of the spirit and also the lower alcohol, the buzz is actually more energizing. So it's just the opposite. It's more energizing. You would think lower alcohol means that, that well, I'm not going to get as high or, you know, I'm not going to have this effect. It's actually just the opposite. See, and it feels like better. And it I just feels I gotta, better. You're more I gotta, energized. Yeah. yeah, I have to throw in this this uh this thing, because one of the things like I told you before, when I would drink alcohol, I would get to a point where you get a little past that like initial buzz, and then it just felt uncomfortable for me. And, and I drink dry right. farm wine. Uncomfortable in your brain. Right. right. You can feel it right here. You it's, feel it. it. You lose what we call creative expression. Mm. and cognitive connection, right? And then you tip over, right? What the Greeks used to mix wine, wine and water together so that they could drink more and more often and still remain in this enlightened euphoria, euphoria and this elevated creative expression. I have to tell you this. I have to tell you this because you're saying this is so cool. So when we do wine night, on Friday, I know we could do it every day or a couple of times a week, but there were usually after an hour of doing a live and kind of just, you know, having a lot of energy on a screen, I would normally, uh, I would normally be like, okay, I'm tired, whatever. And we get to the end of that hour and Scott and I are like, let's do another hour. Like last week I had to make us 
only do an hour so we have more time to hang out before we went to bed, right? Like just have more personal time. But I can go, when I drink I, this wine, I can go on and on. Like my energy level is like, it's like I had a, uh, a pre-workout. <laughs> but so anyway, it's, 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 you're so right when you say that, which is not something I even thought about until we started chatting about it here. Yeah, so it, it's not just the lower alcohol. Lower alcohol is a big component of it. But it's also the living spirit that's in a natural wine. Mm. And I know that sounds kind of hokey, but it's like real, right? Mm -hmm. Because the wine is still living, which is the reason that you'll, you know, the bottles taste different than conventional wine. You know, they're, 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 they haven't been sterilized, what we call mummified or killed. Yes. You know, everything in, in, in a conventional wine has been killed. It's been sterilized with sulfur dioxide, right? Which is the most prevalent additive used in wine, right? It's been, it's been just hammered to mummify or what we call McDonaldize the wine, right? So every single bottle tastes exactly the same, right? And it'll sit on that shelf and be preserved forever, right? Natural wines need to be drank in the first five years of purchase. And most natural wines are drank, you know, very quickly, right? Right. right? So I don't age wine, I drink it, right? And so it's just, it's, it's more of a, this kind of magical elixir natural wine and the spirit of the, the small family farm is in that bottle. See, the other thing about natural wine that's very unique is that the same person who grew the grape, right, fermented the wine, put it in the bottle and, and sent it to me is the same family. It's just this one or handful of people, right? And their spirit in uh, their spirit and their nature is in that bottle, right? When you buy any other kind of alcohol or commercial wine, that's not true. You're, somebody else is growing the grapes, somebody else is growing the wheat for the beer, or somebody else is growing, you know, the potatoes for the vodka or whatever, right? In natural wine, you've got usually one person or a small family that does everything and puts that spirit into the bottle. Mm. And you can taste it, it's alive, it hasn't been sterilized. So let's talk about the sugar element. The single most common question we get is, how are your wines sugar free? Isn't there sugar in grape juice? Yes, there is. So here's how, here's how wine is made. When the juice is pressed, and I'm gonna talk about how red wine becomes red. Red wine or white wine are both put in a press and the juice is pressed off of the berry and juice goes into a tank. At that point, if it's natural wine, you'll have a spontaneous fermentation because yeast is already there. You don't have to add anything, right? And so the yeast is like a little Pac-Man. So the yeast eats sugar Sugar is the food source for the yeast. Now, there's a little device inside the tank that will show you how much sugar is in the wine. And if you allow the yeast to fully ferment, you will end up with a sugar-free wine. What will happen is that the yeast eat all of the available sugar. Right? This takes several days. Eats all of the available sugar. And when all the available sugar is gone, the wine will be sugar free and the yeast will die because they don't have any food source. Mm. Right. And dead yeast are called leaves. And sometimes the leaves are allowed to, to lay in the, lay in the fermentation. Sometimes they're separated, depends on the winemaker's particular style. But so in a conventional wine, this is how sugar gets in wine and sugar is in most wines. And I'll explain that to you in a moment. But so how, sugar gets in wine is that the winemaker introduces sulfur dioxide again to the wine and kills the yeast before it completes fermentation. Remember, there's a device in the tank. He can see exactly how much sugar is left in the wine. When he gets to the, to the amount of sugar that he wants to leave behind in the wine, he kills the yeast with sulfur dioxide. Mm. Okay. And so that's why sugar is not added to wine. Sugar gets in wine. Left in wine. <laughs> yeah, when the fermentation is killed prematurely. Yeah. This is a winemaking style. Now I'll tell you how prevalent it is. The only way to know if wine has sugar in it is to lab test it. Unless it's super sweet and you can taste it. But if it's at lower levels of sugar, sometimes you can't taste it. Even as taste professionals, we can't taste it. We lab test every single wine. And so, and we will not accept any wine that contains less than, it must contain less than one gram per liter. And that's statistically sugar-free. A, a wine bottle is 750 milliliters. So it's three quarters of a liter, right? So we 
all of our wines must contain less than one gram per liter, which at the glass level is statistically sugar free. Right. That's a fully fermented wine. Now, we did lab tests just a couple of months ago on the top 20 selling wines in the United States. And only two of them met our criteria for sugar. Wow. Right. And as low carb keto, I don't eat sugar. I mean, it's, if I do, it's very intentional. I make a lot of effort to avoid sugar for reasons we've already discussed. Don't have it in my house. I, want, I just don't want to be around it. I don't eat con condiments. I don't eat commercial salad dressing, so on and so forth. They all contain sugar. And so I don't want to drink sugar either. So that's how wines become sugar-free. Let's talk about red wine and why it's healthier for a moment. Red wines are healthier because they contain much higher polyphenols. The most famous one is resveratrol. Mm. Red wine contains just over 800 flavonoids, antiflavonoids, and, and, and polyphenols, the healthy compounds that are in wine. Only three things in wine. Those compounds, water, and alcohol, right? Okay. In natural wines. <laughs> There are additives and color agents and all kinds of things in commercial wines, but in a right. real wine, there are only three things. So how it gets, white wine contains just over 200 polyphenols. So there are four times as many in red wine, which is why red wine is thought to be healthier. Although because of the way it's made, it's also more likely to make you feel bad. How red wine gets its color and the increase in these polyphenols is contact with the skin. So when you make a white wine, you press the juice off of the grape and it runs into a tank and it ferments and you throw the skins away. When you make a red wine, you press the juice off of the grapes, you, it goes into a tank and then you take the skin seeds and the stems and you put those in the tank with the juice and that's how it gets its color. Ah. See, if you squeeze the juice from a red wine grape and the juice from a white wine grape, they're both clear. Red wine gets its color and the increase in polyphenols and its tannic, tannin structure from contact or what's called maceration, soaking of the skins, the seeds, and the stems with the juice. That's how it gets tannins and that's how it gets its color. That's also where it gets its higher polyphenols is contact with the skin. So that's the winemaking sort of protocol for how it becomes sugar-free, why wine, red wine is thought to be healthier, and how red wine gets its color. Let's talk for a moment about, in closing up here, about what dry farm wine certification means, right? Because Perfect. not only are we natural, but then we have this certification process <clears throat> that every one wine must meet. So in our case, number one, there's no, we do not allow the use of irrigation. Irrigation is bad for the planet, it's bad for the vine, and it produces a less healthy fruit. Irrigated fruit is lower in polyphenols than dry farmed fruit. That, that's a scientific fact. Same thing for organic farming. Organic fruit is higher in these polyphenols than non-organic farm fruit. Gotcha. gotcha. So, so anyway, we don't dry farmed, uh, organic or biodynamic farming, chemical free farming, native yeast fermentation, which we talked about earlier, no additives, sugar free, and 12 and a half percent or lower in alcohol. So we, the lowest alcohol wine we sell is 7% up to 12 and a half. And we do lab testing for alcohol as well. So you see, another collusion between the government and the wine industry is that the stated alcohol in a wine bottle, by law, is not required to be ac accurate. Oh. And can be as high as a percent and a half higher than what's stated on the bottle. And we're very serious, as I've already discussed with you, about drinking lower alcohol. So we, that's another thing that we test for. So those are, those are our criteria and we lab test every single wine that we drink and sell. I drink the same wines that you're drinking, right? And so I choose mine specifically, specifically, I choose mine to be a little lower in alcohol just because that's a personal preference, right? And we have low alcohol programs. People can get low alcohol, extra low, we call them. All mm -hmm. of our wines are low alcohol, but extra low. So if you're looking for natural wine, and if you're going to drink wine, I suggest that you drink natural wine. Now they're hard to find and they're rare. You can find them in large markets, New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, you know, Washington. You, you, you're gonna find natural wines in larger markets. Not a lot, but they're there, right? And you can do that through a Google search, searching natural wines in your area. 
or you can download a free smartphone app that I have no affiliation with. It's called Raisin. Then Raisin is the most popular app for finding natural wine restaurants, bars, and retailers. Ah. It's very active in Europe. They're based in Europe. Uh, it's quite active in New York and San Francisco and, and, and a handful of markets. But even in San Francisco, near where I live, there are only three natural wine retailers and they're all tiny shops, tiny, right? So if you buy wine from a natural wine retailer, now not all natural wines are going to be sugar free. Not all natural wines are going to be low alcohol. Not all natural wines are going to meet our criteria, right? So that's the reason our criteria is a little above just natural. But if you don't mind drinking the extra alcohol or potentially getting a little sugar, you, you, then you know you should at least be drinking natural wines because you're getting native yeast fermentation, organic farming, so on and so forth. Or you know naturally you can you can buy wine from us, and the best way to do that you can get a penny bottle of wine from you, as a courtesy to your yes. audience, just by going to the link dryfarmwines.com forward slash Sean T and yes. get a penny bottle there. But uh, any questions, anything I didn't cover? First of all, you're so relatable and what it is that in terms of like the health, the fitness, the motivation. And there were some points that you were talking about and you said like the wine has energy in there, it's living. And I'm, I think everything has energy. You know, I think that energy from the people, from that, you know, from that family that makes the wine, I believe that it touches your soul when you drink it. So I'm everything there Everything is you. connected, my brother. 100%. So my only question for you is, have you ever been to, have you ever visited any of these families or these people where you get dry farm wines from? And did you, have you had an experience with I, them? I, th I was in Europe over 200 days last year. I'm on farms all, except for COVID right now. I mean, you know, not, I would, I would be in Europe right now as we speak, Yeah. yeah. you know, basically for the whole summer and living on far family farms and, you know, and traveling between cities. So I might go to London for a few days and then I'll go out uh, to Austria and, you know, basically live on farms for a week or two. And then, you know, then maybe I fly to Milan for the, for a design show. And then I go out into the countryside of Italy and stay on family farms. So I have one final question and we didn't touch on this a lot, but a lot of my listeners are entrepreneurs or people who are really trying to go after their goals and you've built such a successful business and i think that what's also really great is you are able to touch people's lives and other entrepreneurs like me and you know like i said i heard from shaleen and we really really i mean i love the wine for what it does to me and the experience that i get but also before even meeting and talking to you today, I just love the company and what it stands for. So how can, what kind of advice can you give people out there who are trying to grow their business to really continue to trust and believe that, you know, what they're doing, they're on the right path, you know, when they hit those moments of barriers and they want to kind of give up? Oh, wow. Um, man, I've been bruised so many times, fallen hard, you know, had some tough times, been broke twice. Mm. Self-employed since I was 17, you know, I'm, um, started about 10 companies. I had a, the company before this one was a terrible failure, lost everything, went broke for the second time, you know, so it's tough, you know, but for me, you know, success is about standing up when we fall down and putting and having the courage to put one foot in front of the other again, right? Cause it's hard. Because when you get beat up, man, it's tough. Mm. And so that's the reason I think meditation, my company spends the first hour of every day meditating together. Now we do it via Zoom, but we have a meditation room at our, at our office. It's actually the largest room in our building. And all we use it for is meditation. That's how dedicated we are to the practice. And so we meet at 10 in the morning and then we meditate until 11, have gratitude practices and journaling and other sort of self-development practices during this period. And, um, and we also discuss a lesson of the day, you know, a lesson example might be why attachment is the source of all suffering. Mm. Right. And so I believe meditation is the foundation of a well-lived life. And so, and meditating with other people is the foundation of connectivity. It's hard, you know, for me, when I, after my last failure, which was six years ago, I made a list of 18 business rules. You know, I mean, I've been self-employed since I was 17, so I'm not employable, right? I was going to start another company. I didn't know it was going to be dry farm wines. But at the top of that list of 18 rules, 
at the top of the list was, and not everyone agrees with this, right? But at the top of the list was, I'm going to do something that I love so much that I'd be willing to do it for free. Mm. And a lot of people don't agree with that. There's a lot of people that don't agree with I that. I agree with that because similar, I mean, I've been only self-employed, but I started working at 16 years old and most of my employment happened from me going out and pushing the boundaries and doing something that's fearful and getting uncomfortable. And I have been offered lots of money to do something that I was just like, that's gonna probably take me to the next level of my life in terms of finances. And I only do things that I would do for free. Like like every time I've done something for money, it's caused a problem. Oh, money man. should be the result of what you do, not the reason why you do it. Mm -mm -mm. Right. And so for me, if I were to, to, to advise someone, I don't generally give advice because people don't generally take it. <laughs> <laughs> True. But I would say, begin a meditation practice and let the universe serve you. Mm. right? Let it come to you. You don't have to go to it. It will come right to you. Abundance, when you have a clear mind, when you open the channels through the silence of your mind, mm. when you become, when your mind becomes silent, the abundance will flow to you. Right now, that busyness, that anxiety of your mind is creating resistance that blocks your birthright abundance that we are all due from the universe, right? And so that's how I think about that. And I'm going to have to do something that I feel so passionate about and that I love so much. Another rule was I'm not going to travel to places that don't replenish me, mm. right? I'm not going to travel to Houston. That doesn't replenish me. I'm not going to travel to, to, to Kansas City. That's not replenishing for me. I want to go to Paris or Milan or London or New York or, you know, my place at the beach in Santa Monica or I, I'm, you know, that was another rule. So, I'm going to do something that's going to incorporate all of these rules, but it's going to have to be something that I'm willing to do for free. And what I do today, I would happily do for free. I was paying to do it before anyway. <laughs> right. Right. So, so for me to be able to be here with you and to spread this love and this message of the connected universe and its power, I do that for free every single day. Yeah. You know, and I, and I, I know we don't have much time, but I do want to say this. When I often, when I tell my story of how I got to where I am today, you know, a lot of people use the word luck and I understand that, but also like everything that I've done from minute one to this moment has been connected. It's been 100% connected. I have never, there have been times where people are like, you should do this. And I knew it was two steps ahead of what I should be doing. And people would question why I didn't go ahead and take that opportunity. And I, I said, this opportunity is not connected to that opportunity. Yet, I need to take that step. I need to experience this and I need to have that link in the chain in order for me to continue forward or else I would feel absolutely unauthentic going to that place. And so... Um, I'm just so had, I'm so happy you said that because I believe that connectedness is just, is the way you progress in your life if you let yourself become present and aware of what's happening at this moment. Present, calm, and silent to receive your birthright abundance. Look, the farmers, when I, you know, I stay with these families and travel, you know, all over the world with them. Look, the farmer knows everything is connected. Mm. Every, every particle, every atom, everything in the universe is connected to something, right? And we're all connected to it. And if we find that silence and that presence to allow that connection to flow more readily, you know, look, you can, you can get wealthy through, through resistance. You can get wealthy. You can claw your way there for sure. Absolutely. And that's the most proven method. Because most people are fearful of doing less to have more, mm. right? They think they got to claw their way there. And it's an effective and proven method, but it doesn't produce much joy. It doesn't produce peace, right? And the single most, I was just talking to my partner this morning about it, I said the single most important thing in my life is peace.
And from that, all other things will flow. When we're at peace, then we will find profit. Trust me. And it's 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 like, do you enjoy the end result? Like, do you are when you can't enjoy the present moment? You know. Let let me let me close on this. We're, we're yeah, super I, I was gonna here, say I was gonna long. I was gonna close it, but I'm gonna we're, let you close. We're gonna this. get in a wormhole here. <laughs> but you know, everything we do is in the pursuit of being loved or loving mm -hmm. everything we do. And so if we can find that path to love and to self, first of all, self love, if we can find that path, then we're going to find that the journey, I'm going to close with this. See, the journey is the most important thing. The destination is death for us all. And most people live their life in chunks of destination. When I get here, I'm going to be able to do this. When I make enough money, I'm going to be able to do what I really want to do, right? Now, you see the destination, the only destination that we all share it is death. Mm. The only thing that's important is the journey to our destination. And I'll, and I'll just add to that to finish. My very first EPK that you get, press kit that you make, you know, everyone was like, it has to have this and like kind of flashy. And I was like, well, if it has to have that, I need to have what my message is right away to be the most powerful thing in this in this EPK. And that message was um, a song from that indie I heard from India Irie and it was life is a journey, not a destination. There are no mistakes, just chances we've taken lay down your regrets because all you have is now. And so I love how you said we are all just walking each other home and I'm gonna finish with that and always trust and believe in who you are. Thank I love you. you brother. Thanks for having me on today. I love you Batman. It Thank you so good, much. It was a great time.